Hello again, I am Blunty, and what I've got for you today is an amazing behind-the-scenes tour. The, the access like this I've never had before with any other company that says, hey, come check out a campus or a factory or a plant or whatever. No one ever lets me film this stuff. I've been on some really interesting tours, but no one ever lets me film it. But NVIDIA did. And you will have to forgive some of the less than spectacular camera work. I'm a little bit self-conscious about the camera work in this video. It was a, it's a working laboratory. You know, it's very crowded, very messy. There's a big group of us coming through, and it's very difficult to try and get the shot. And, you know, there were no retakes because it was just a tour and we're on a time schedule and everything and they're jostling people and people walking in front of my shots and, and so I did my best but some of the shots are, are not up to what I would call my usual standards but aside from that it is an amazing behind the scenes I mean you're going to learn things you never even dreamed of I mean the kinds of lengths that NVIDIA go to to figure out you know, when they get a chip coming back that has a problem the kind of lengths they go to to figure out where it failed and why and how and the, 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 the machines they use to use it it's all it's incredible I was just nerding out the entire time so you're like you got any shots at all I was just going to go oh that's so cool look at that over there trying to film the thing anyway <laughs> that's enough of me rambling I'll get a show it to you now but watch the whole thing it is so cool just the hell out of it. okay hi I'm Howard Marks I'm the director of technology operations silicon failure analysis lab here at NVIDIA as you know NVIDIA is a fabulous semiconductor company with thousands of people doing logic design and thousands of people doing software and a couple hundred of us here in operations that work with the fabs and the assembly houses to make the chip. And we monitor what they're doing to make sure that they're gonna make a good product. We make on the order of 10 million parts a month. So if there's a small little problem, that's a lot of stuff we have to throw away. So we monitor what's going on. So we have here a world-class failure analysis lab in which we can look inside the chip to see what we're getting and to make sure it's uh, what we need and what the customer needs and monitor what's going on. Um, the part you have in your hand is our latest production, a GM200 graphics processor that has inside of it 9 billion transistors. Wow. An Intel CPU with 8 cores is like 2 billion transistors. 9 billion transistors. And as you know, uh, the NVIDIA world, more and more parallel processing graphics processors is the way to go. And we just keep pushing more and more parts into our device. Mm -hmm. My job in this lab, by the way, is to find the one transistor that failed. Oh. Uh, <laughs> one because there's usually only one that fails. Let me show you some of the things in the lab here. This is our scanning electron microscope lab where we actually look inside the chip. This is an example of a cross section of the chip you have in your hand where you can see that it's made up of multiple layers of metal that will route all of the signals across the chip. All the transistors are down here on the bottom level and then we have all these metal lines to route it across. If you took this size image across the chip in your hand, this picture would go for two miles. And that's only one slice across the device. It's hard concept, nine billion transistors. Looking for, I have an analogy, looking for a failure inside the chip is analogous to looking for a discarded hamburger bun mm -hmm. by the side of the road in rural Pennsylvania, looking at the road maps from that space station through a telescope. Because that's how far away we are and how small the device is. A 150,000 mile space station is like our uh, 70,000 X magnification we have to do to just go see the transistor inside the device. Now, if that failure was a pothole in the road, we could see the, the cars jump as it goes over the pothole going, ah, that's where a problem is. And that's where I'll show you some of our backside probing techniques where we look for the signals glitching and go, ah, that's where the failure is. And then, that, and then we strip it down, go find out all the way down to the transistor level exactly where the failure is and then uh, see what caused it, feed that back to the fab. They will look up on the chip that we did the analysis on, on what layer the failure was found, and go back in their records and say, ah, that layer was built on this day on this machine, and then they will go and PM that machine to make sure it doesn't fail like that again. 
So the whole idea is to improve our yield to make sure that we find the failure and we don't have it again. And that's what we do in this lab. So we have things like this, which is a scanning electron microscope capable of 300,000 X magnification. This picture of the transistor up here was 70,000 X, so 300, we can still see it. It has on it an energy dispersive X-ray, which tells you what element you're looking at. We actually use the periodic table in our lab here, where we can actually see what element is, where, is used where, so that we can see where the hafnium is, where the tantalum is, where the copper is, so we can see if there's any shorts or any material that shouldn't be there, so that we can analyze what we're getting from the fabs to make sure that what we're getting is what we need and what will work. Over there is our uh, latest acquisition, a uh, focused ion beam. It's very similar to the scanning electron microscope. This one is a $2.6 million machine that can go in and magnify up to 1.5 million X magnification. Because as the devices are getting smaller, we have to do even more magnification. It's so sensitive that I had to put in $10,000 worth of sound deadening material because my voice will show up on the picture because it's so sensitive to vibration. Uh, it has in it a scanning electron microscope, similar to that one, where in a little tiny electron, you know, that little tiny particle goes around the atom, goes down the column, bounces off the device, and you get an image. At the same time, a secondary X-ray is emitted. We count the outer shell electrons, and it tells you what element you're looking at on the periodic table. This one also has a focused ion beam in which we use a gallium ion from the periodic table, we know that that's a lot of protons and neutrons, so it's a big heavy atom. When it comes down, it actually mills a hole into the device. So what we do is we electrically identify where we think the failure is at, and then we actually cut a hole into the device, tilt it, and look at it and go, oh yeah, that's where the failure is, right there where that contact is. And then go see under our energy dispressive x-ray to see what elements are there, to see if there's a, a hole in the barrier, metal, or what the problem was and feed that back to the fab. So that's what we do in here is we do this cross section, see exactly what the failure is, and then go feed it back. Our very latest tool is this one. This is an AFM, atomic force microscope. This looks at one atom at a time. Atom, yeah, we're down to atoms now. So that when we find out where the failure is in the transistor, we can scan along the transistor to see where the short is and then do a TEM cross section right there and find out exactly what the failure is. So we're now messing with atoms just to find our failure, especially when we get down to the 10 nanometer test chips we're looking at now, it gets even smaller. All right, just come on in here, let's all gather around. right here is a one million dollar 3D x-ray machine. When you take a part and you solder it onto the board, it's the, the solder balls that are on the back of your chip, these little solder balls get melted onto the board. Sometimes they'll short, sometimes they'll have a problem, so we can do an x-ray and look at the back side, look at through the board to see if any of it is shorted. However, the problem is that there's a tiny ball on the chip and there's a bigger ball inside the back of the chip. So you have one ball on top of another and you can only see one. However, if you did the x-ray while you rotated it, ah, you can see that there's two balls. So this machine right here rotates the device, taking 1,600 images of the device as you rotate it and then convert it to a movie. It used to take 11 hours to convert it to a movie. Now with our CUDA card, it takes three minutes. 11 hours going to three minutes using our graphics, using our NVIDIA graphics card, and we end up with a 3D image of what we're looking at. This is in, totally inside of a plastic part, a little bit of solder rolled over here and shorted these two together. Totally encapsulated, totally inside the part, but we know exactly what the failure mode is and what to do about it to go fix it. And here we have our device with the balls on the back of the chip like you see, and then the tiny little bumps that are on the die in front, and we can actually see if there's any problems, any shorts, or any kind of connection problem, and 
get a really good view of what's going on inside there with this 3D x-ray machine. Now you got to remember this is a working lab. It's not cleaned up for a tour, right? Just so you, I can have a disclaimer there. In here is our chem lab. We don't go in there. It has all the chemicals in the semiconductor industry, hot sulfuric acid, hot nitric acid, HF, all the things that allow us to deprocess the part one layer at a time to go find out exactly what layer the failure is at to find the one transistor or the one via that failed so that we can do our job and find out why it failed and figure that out. So some of the hot acid in there, hot, we uh, use it to decap some of the plastic parts. It squirts hot anhydrous sulfuric acid at 270 degrees centigrade. If you squirt that in your hand, it would go right through it. So we don't really go in there. <laughs> We'll look at this machine. The same way we look through silicon dioxide glass is transparent to visible light. Silicon is transparent to infrared light. So here we have an infrared camera that we hook up while we're running the part at speed, at temperature, uh, hooked up to a PC board, and we can mo monitor the temperature across the device with 0.1 degree C accuracy on a three micron spot size so that we can see exactly how hot the chip gets. Then we can turn off some of the TPC, some of the cores, and watch that area get cooler, turn on others, watch those get hotter, so we know exactly what temperature is going on inside of our chip. Each device has an internal thermal diode that monitors that temperature, and if the thermal diode says it's getting too hot, it turns the fan on faster. And if it's cooler, it turns the fan on slower to make less noise. And if it overheats, it'll turn off the device. So we do all of that calibration of any new part right here to make sure that that thermal diode is totally correct and that that's what we use in our production to go send out to every part. So we do all this thermal analysis to go find out what's going on inside of our chip. This is our $2.6 million backside probe system. Remember I said that the silicon is transparent to infrared light. So this uses an infrared laser that shines into the device, reflects back, and we get an image of the device. We'll then power it up and we can actually see where each transistor is powered up and we can go and, and low overlay the layout and say, oh, on, on, oh, that one's off. There's a problem here. Now we, got, now we have an idea where the problem is. Again, that scene where the car bumps in the road, that's where the signal changes. And we can actually probe the signals inside the device to see what went wrong to that signal and go identify that's where the failure is. We'll then strip it down at that area to go find out what the failure was. When we find something on the order of a 0.1% yield problem, you know, that's really small, 0.1%. And we find it, we go and have the fab fix it, and then we don't have that 0.1% yield problem, that's on the order of $7 million in revenue a quarter that we would get back for that. Because making 10 million parts a month is a lot of wafers. And so I go to do a buy an additional $2 million machine, and the bean counter says, oh, $7 million a quarter, okay, $2 million machine, sure, go right ahead. And so that's what this is. This machine is a backside probing system, which, which has inside of it, and try not to bump them when they're connected, an upside down laser that scans into the device that's on a load board that's hooked up to a million dollar ATE tester, automatic test equipment, ATE, that this tests the part by sending gigahertz signals in, clocking it through the device and hit gigahertz signals out and sees if all the signals are good. When one fails, we then do analysis and say, oh, in this area, one of these 500 cells was the problem. We then go to our backside probing and probe binary search through those 500 until we find the one that failed and that's where the failure is. So I'm finding the one transistor that failed. Okay, so I'll wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. The
The last one we have is this area. This is where we do our ESD testing. As you know, ESD is, a, our parts are sensitive to ESD. So we actually zap each and every I.O. with 3,500 volts and see if it can withstand that. And 200 volts machine model. And if it can't withstand that, we'll then find out where that failure is, strip it down, bring the designer, and then he'll show, oh, this contact was too close to this area, and he'll redesign it to be farther away so if it can withstand it the next time. So we actually do this test on every part that come, every new part that comes through. Those white machines are one million dollar ESD testers that will very accurately test every I.O. of the pins to make sure that the device can withstand the voltages needed in order to make it through the assembly line, make it through people plugging it into a PC without any failure occurring. And so that's the ATE and FA lab here at NVIDIA.